Hello, this is Harry Conway, a.k.a. David Lloyd, and this is How's That Cricket Podcast you're listening to. You missed the bad, I caught you on How's That? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of How's That? The Cricket Podcast with me, Ollie. And me, Lily. We've got another bumper guest on the podcast this week. We have got Adelaide Strikers fast bowler, Harry Conway, funny man. What a guy he is, and it was an absolute pleasure to speak to him. Yeah, no, it was. And so obviously just to give a bit of a, a heads up for this episode. Now, this is a pre-record. Um, Ollie is on holiday, so we won't be talking about any cricket this week. It, it will be purely just the interview. But yeah, like we mentioned, Harry Conway, we've had this one sitting in the bank for quite some time. So we're glad to finally release it. But yeah, a, a brilliant person, isn't he? He's so funny. And he really, really showed that in his interview, didn't he? Yeah, well, you'd be able to hear off the top, actually, how funny he is. Because, um, you know, how we do the intros. We got him to do uh, the David Lloyd style intro. So you can already tell, you know, what a funny person he is if you haven't seen him or, you know, play cricket or be on the mic before. But he's a brilliant interviewee. Just very, very funny. We came away from this one just thinking, how good was that? As we do with, with all of our interviews. But that one was just like, that was hilarious. That was amazing. Can't wait to, to get this one out. So, uh, yeah, Harry Conway, enjoy the interview. Faces Conway. It's scooped. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. No worries, thanks for having me. So can you tell us where in the world you are at the moment and what teams you're kind of a part of and you know what cricket you've been playing recently? Yeah, so I, I'm in Adelaide at the moment. Uh, I moved down from Sydney about uh, five months ago. So currently we're in round two of the Sheffield Shield and uh, we've played two Marsh One Day Cup games for the South Australian Redbacks. And I'm also a part of the Adelaide Strikers. Um, this summer will be my fourth summer with the Strikers. Brilliant. So, yeah, like you mentioned, the Redbacks have started with those two tournaments, I guess. So how have you found it personally being a part of the Redbacks? And, yeah, how have you found it within the team and the game so far? Yeah, it's been good. It's been completely different to um, my experience in New South Wales, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> New South Wales, uh, when I came in, about 10 years ago, they had a lot more, um, you know, established, experienced players um, than I'd say the Redbacks do now. I'd, I'd probably say that I'm one of those players for South Australia um, alongside Kerry Head and Jake Lehman. So it's a really young group. Um, lots of people I haven't met. Uh, I don't have established connections with outside of um, the guys that play for the Strikers. But um I love, uh, love being able to go into the Adelaide Oval every day and train and use the facilities. Um, and I think the, the opportunities that I'll get to play um, with this team will be greater than um, the ones that perhaps I was going to for New South Wales. So I'm in a much different role um, and I'm certainly being taken out of my comfort zone, but um, I, I have enjoyed the, the role that I've played for the team so far. And um, I further developed some of those connections that I had with the guys from the Strikers, um, guys like Jake Weatherald, um, Alex Carey, Travis Head, who were with us before the Test summer, um, and some of the young guys that are coming through as well. It was uh, it was nice last week to be able to bowl uh, alongside some really promising young bowlers in Australia. Yeah, certainly. Obviously, now you're um, you now with the Redbacks and you're with the Strikers, so you've got all your cricket based in. SA. So you joined the Strikers for BBL 09, I think it was. You, you moved there a few years ago. Um, why was it that you made the move across from the from the Sixers to the Strikers? Was it a new challenge? Do you think the, the Strikers were better suited to you as a cricketer or another reason, perhaps? Yeah, I, I had a couple of... I think it was 06 and 08 or 07 and 08 uh, BBLs with the Sixers. And I was just on the books, basically, as a replacement for Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood during the Test summer. So um, I knew that I was pretty lucky to be there, um, and I was just—it was sort of like an internship for me in terms of upskilling. Um, I wasn't playing a great deal for New South Wales at the time, but the Sixers took a bit of a gamble on me, um, and I was very close to playing a couple of games, but really nothing substantial. So, as soon as the strikers' opportunity came up, it, it was basically surrounding um, Ben Lockman, who wanted a release from his contract. Um, he'd, be, he'd been historically one of their one of their most successful bowlers, but. Uh, he wanted to go to the Heat, I think, for his family. So once they lost him late in the piece um, as the contracting ended, I think I was probably the best of the rest in terms of um, guys that were bowling well in state cricket at the time. I know I was 
in the top four or five bowlers in the shield. So Tim Nielsen called me in and my management and um, yeah, I jumped at the opportunity straight away. It was, it was a very easy decision for me. And um, I think I played five games in that first year, which is more than I expected. So um, yeah, ever, ever since I've come down, I've been really, um, really happy with my experience with the strikers. And um, I think Adelaide Oval was probably the best round to play at um, out of all the teams and stuff. So it was, it was very easy, uh, very easy decision. Yeah, it's a wonderful ground, Adelaide Oval. I can't blame you for having that as your, your favourite in the country. But you've spoken a couple of times about, you know, while being at the Sixers, you had Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood to, you know, to you know fill in the shoes of pretty much. And then when you move across to the Adelaide Strikers, you've got Ben Lachlan, who, as you said, was a wonderful bowler for them. And um, What is it like sort of not only just filling in shoes and trying to replace players, but also making your own imprint on these, uh, on these teams? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I was pretty... <laughs> I was pretty daunted. I, I certainly didn't want the strikers to think that they were getting what they were getting from Ben Lachlan from me um, straight off the bat, uh, which is great because I certainly couldn't deliver that. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't look at it in that. I, I, I remember coming down and taking the opportunity and being really confident in the way I was bowling. Um, certainly not in the T20 format. I was, I'd, I'd had very limited experience, but because I'd, I'd been bowling so well for New South Wales, I was pretty confident that if I did get an opportunity, I'd just sort of... Um, you know, find my way in the game and um, knowing guys like Siddle, uh, Head, Kerry, um, like there was enough experience in the team around me to sort of guide me through and help me through. And strikers were pretty good. I think I bowled some of the easier overs, uh, easier overs in that first tournament. Um, and I remember playing the Renegades twice. So you look at that and you go, look, the, he's probably playing the easier games in the schedule. No offense to any Renegades fans, but, um, you know, at the time they were, they, they weren't great. Um, and I think we were giving a few guys a rest. So, they were pretty good in the way that they massaged me into the team. Um, and then from there, mate, I just, yeah, I just, you know, you, you get confidence in every game. I think first game I got two for 32 against the Scorchers was pretty good at the Adelaide Oval. So straight away, I just, I, you know, I gained a bit of self-belief. And um, yeah, as I say, like down here, there's um, a few senior players and stuff, but there's, there's not exactly a team of um, guys that have, uh, you know, done it time and time again. Um, they were still establishing themselves as a team. I know they'd won one tournament against the Hurricanes um, with Ben Lachlan and these guys. But with the turnover of players that they had, I was pretty confident that I could, you know, if, if I was playing well, I could try and cement my, my spot in the side. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, you've, you've certainly done well over the last few years to, to get yourself into that striker's side and play, you know, later on in tournaments as you did last year. But you spoke again about New South Wales, which is something I want to go back to very briefly. You've had, you know, the chance to play alongside some wonderful bowlers. You talk about Hazelwood. Stark, Pat Cummins, who you, you're a housemate with at, at one time, maybe a little bit more on that later, but you've had the chance to work with or play with, you know, Australia's best over the last 10 years. And uh, what lessons have you learned from, you know, those three and perhaps some others as well that, have, you know, you've been able to incorporate into your own game? Yeah, it's, 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 it's probably been one of the highlights of my career is, is being able to um, rub shoulders with those guys. And, and that's the beauty of being able to play at New South Wales. Um, you know, you get to bowl at David Warner and Steve Smith and even that as an experience, you know, you, you don't get that anywhere else in Australia. So, um, like, that makes you a better cricketer already, um, you know, because you get punished when you bowl a certain area to these guys versus when you bowl to the domestic players. Um, but for the Aussie guys, it's more about how they prepare, um, the way they live their lives away from um, the cricket field and the training ground, um, what they do in the gym that's specific to bowling, um, their run-up speeds, what, what type of data they look at when they're releasing the ball. Um, uh, the preparation in, in, in terms of like gear, clothing, um, bowling boots, um, all that stuff going in and out of games um, is amazing. And then, you know, what time they get to the ground, what time um, do they start preparing for the game? Um, and those types of things, I, I would say, in, in terms of in-game, I would say the, the biggest adjustment they make is is they're so they're very level and confident in their own ability. So they're very they're they're very level headed when the game's um, throwing a million things at you at once. So um, having that those type of mannerisms or um, you know just the way that they conduct themselves when they're bowling or they're out in the field, you you're able to you, it releases so much um, tension for the group that they're playing with because there's no panic um, and there are no rash decisions. So yeah, those those guys were able to to do what they do so consistently um, for good reason. And I think the process they go in and out of games and training 
um, and the training ground to is is the reason that they are able to be so consistent and um, their performances show that. Yeah, they certainly do, especially with uh, with Smith and Warner and all the balls. <laughs> um, as an England fan, it's been tough to watch over the last few years. <laughs> in, Ashes, in Ashes series, just watching, you know, all these Australian players tear us apart. But, um, you know, definitely good mentors to learn off and uh, to get advice from. But, but back to Pat Cummins, um, it's been you know put on record that you said you, you room with him for a certain while, your housemates with him. Um, what was he like to live with? Obviously, we know what he's like as a cricketer on field, but what was he like off field? And have you got any um, any stories that, you know, any good memories from the time that you spent living with him? <laughs> well, he's probably got more good stories um, that he hasn't released yet, and I hope he doesn't about me. But he, um, I, I just, I hit it off really, really early um, with Pat from like a, you know, an under, under 19s, under 17s level. Uh, he was from a di- completely different part of Sydney and, one of the funny stories earlier on was that he was going to teach me how to bat and bowl when I came to training. If I if I uh, did some of his HSC assignments, his English assignments, and read the books that we were prescribed to read in Year Twelve for his um for his final exams, he wasn't he wasn't that interested in study. But as we as we grew up and and we grew along our journey, obviously he went he went to Australia quite early, um, and I was a, a much slow much slower progression. Um, you know when when we moved in or when I moved into his place. He, again, he was very organised. Um, he had an English uh, partner who I got along with really well. Um, and we lived with his older brother for a little while as well, but um, really tidy, really organised, um, great with his time. Like, uh, he was time savvy. And he and I were doing the same degree at the same time as well at UTS. We were studying business in Sydney. So um, we both liked reading. Um, you know, he had a barbecue at his place. So we we just, we, we'd go in and out of training together um, and he was on a, a rehab journey. So... Uh, his back was really bad and he was, he was pumping himself back up um, to come through the ranks at New South and then eventually back to the test team. But just feel like we're pretty like-minded people. Um, both got a really good sense of humour and bounced off each other a fair bit. Um, he's really giving with his time, not only with like sponsors and, and work commitments, but to his mates um, and to the important people around him. He's really close with his family as well. So that's something that he and I both share in common. Um, I would say, but it was pretty cool because I knew I wasn't going to have that opportunity for long. Um, you know, even though we're very close, um, I knew that he'd be back in Australian colours very soon. So, um, yeah, those, those those training sessions we had were invaluable together and we were living in and out of each other's pockets, which was great. But, um, yeah, he was always going to kick on to bigger and better things, unfortunately. I mean... Yeah, again, he he has kicked on. He's done quite a lot of um, you know special things for Australia with a cricket ball. He's he's unreal. Um, but you know, you spoke about development there um, in that in that answer, and you said um, you know how he had a different trajectory to, to you. So your first class debut came at the age of twenty four, which you know some say maybe you know some circles perhaps quite late. You know some might be fine, but um, it was at twenty four when you made your debut in the Sheffield Shield. How did you sort of progress to that level? What clubs were you playing at? Where did you get picked up from? And what was the step up like from, from that level of cricket to uh, to Sheffield Shield? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And, and, and nowadays, I think it's getting younger and younger. Um, you know, I think the average career these days is, is still quite small. It's still, uh, you know, two to three years. But as you say, it is getting younger. And, and guys, you know, they're Teague Wiley over in Perth is 18 or 19. So... There's some really good cricketers out there. Um, and I think each state's probably getting a little bit carried away with trying to find the next one. But, um, yeah, I, man, I was definitely a slow burn. I was four years on a rookie contract and I was playing at Northern Districts in Sydney, um, right near where mum and dad still reside today. So I went to school there um, and then up the road was a cricket club. And some of my fondest memories are with uh, guys that I played green shield cricket with, which is like under 23s or under 21. So love the club. Um, I was there for four or five years, um, elevated into first grade pretty early, which was good. Um, but yeah, a bit of a slow burn at New South. Like uh, there were some great bowlers ahead of me. Um, I was aware of that. I was studying the background as well. So um, started my business degree, Bachelor of Business um, in the city at Sydney. So that was close to the SCG because I was about a 45 minute drive from mum and dad's. Um, so yeah, I look back on it now pretty fondly. By the time it, you know, there would have been a lot of self doubt, and um, you know, a lot of uh, my eggs probably split into two baskets because I didn't believe that I'd, I'd be able to go to where I wanted to go. You know, with uh, guys like Copeland, Layla, Bollinger, um, Hazelwood, Stark, uh, Sandu at the time, um, and you know, I was a part of a, 
a rookie group that always had other other fast bowlers in it, like Josh Layla, Nick Bills. Um, so there was a heap of depth in New South Wales, which was awesome. But um, I, I probably I probably got through to the top team. Unfortunately, as it sounds, it was probably by non non performance by Sandu and maybe a couple of other fast bowlers. They they weren't taking twenty wickets as regularly or as quickly as they'd like. Um, and I remember uh, Arjun Nair made his debut the game before at Coffs Harbour against South Australia. Um, and the coach called me. I, uh, the head coach was Trent Johnson at the time. And um, he called me and said, uh, you know, I got wickets during the week against a tour in Canterbury side from New Zealand at Bankstown. And then I played on the Saturday for Northern Districts against Western Suburbs and got five wickets again. So I got a few in a short, a short space of time and just taking my opportunities there. But yeah, when he called me, I was over the moon. It was obviously a dream come true. I remember I was in my driveway, told mum and dad that I was going to Hobart um, to debut at Blunston Arena. And it was usually, you know, pretty quick friendly. So it was between Arjun there and I, and he's obviously an off spinner. So I was pretty, I was pretty confident I was going to play. Um, mum and dad didn't arrive in time for my, my baggy uh, presentation, but they were there for all of day one, which is when I did the damage, um, or we, we did all of our damages, New South Welshman, um, in a really good and exciting game. But the, the biggest thing that I remember out of that was mum and dad being there and, and being able to realise a childhood dream. And, and we won the game, which is the most important thing. And one of my close friends now, Nick Madison, was captain. So, um, yeah, it was a pretty special moment. And then we went to Northern Territory to Alice Springs, and we had to win that game to get into the Shield final. So it would have all happened really quickly. Um, you know, after you say I was a bit of a slow burner and unfortunately we drew. So um, it ended in tears a little bit, but the first two games that I had were really eye-opening because we went from, you know, the cold Hobart climate to um, the heat in Alice Springs. And um, yeah, so I was throwing a few curveballs early on. Yeah. Due to how important these games were, do you feel like you were maybe thrown into the deep end a little bit or did you feel ready going into those games at that point? Yeah, well, luckily, luckily, as I said, because I come in, I mean, I come into some form um, really recently to to being called in. I, I was that's why I was super confident going into the game. Obviously, I was really nervous and really anxious about how I was going to go. But um, you know, as you mentioned before, like four years as a rookie is pretty rare. You're either in and out after two or three, or you're up to the full list. So, um, having done that internship as a as a four year sort of rookie player um, and playing lots of second eleven cricket, and then um, a bit of club cricket as well. You know, by 24, it was sort of like, well, if you're not ready now, when are you ready? So um, that, that's kind of the way in hindsight I probably looked at it at the time. But um, I think you probably get to a certain level of second level cricket now. It's a, it's a pretty, it was a really strong tournament back when I played because there wasn't any age restrictions and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I was always playing the best players in Australia when I played. And, um, I found it really challenging when I was playing those games Monday to Thursday. So I think, you know, by the time you play, say, I would have played between uh, probably upwards of 20 games by then. So as I say, by then I've been given enough opportunity. It was about me taking that opportunity and um, look back at it now. I'm really thankful for the four years that I did training and um, working on my craft. Um, obviously, you know, you want to play as much as you can, but I don't think I was ready before the time that I played, to be honest. So um and, and and new south wales as i say there's always a long queue of fast bowlers and i can't confidently sit here and say that i was better than doug and all these guys it's it's an absolute fallacy mm. and then talking about your list a debut you made uh, that in a one day final in 2016 against quite a star-studded queensland side how did you find that game and were there any nerves floating around for that game there lots of nerves because i I'd, I'd, I'd been in the squad for the entire tournament and i was living with pat uh, Pat Cummins at the time, um, he was obviously playing, so really excited for our guys and stuff like that. But and it was only really, you know, the morning that we were playing at North Sydney that um, I think Pat Moses and I, um, he was he was telling me in the car that he was talking to the coach on the way to the ground, and you know, while we were on the car, there was a good chance that I might debut. So I was pretty shocked, obviously, and I was a bit rattled, but. Um, yeah, definitely really nervous and then got presented my cap with another guy, Nick Larkin, who, I was, who I'm really close with now. But it was a whirlwind because I felt like there was about half an hour to go before we started the game. And that was the time that we got told that he'd open the batting and, and I'd be bowling. So, um, yeah, I remember it was Nathan Lyon, myself, Pat Cummins, Doug Bollinger and Trent Copeland with the uh, five bowlers and um, 
Nathan Lyon was man of the match. He was unbelievable. But you're right, they had an amazing team. Um, they had Kawaja, Burns, Lynn, Cutting, um, Manus, all these guys. So, yeah, it was, that was one of the best days I've ever had in a cricket field for sure. And at the end of it, yeah, you're a one-day champion. And that was my first uh, That was my first taste of one-day cricket. So that was, you know, I've only played, I think I've only played 13, 14, 15 games in that format as well. So it's probably the the biggest highlight was the was the first game that I got uh, in North Sydney against the Bulls. Yeah, and not a bad way to start a 50 over career winning a game yeah. like that is that against a team like Queensland because like you said the, the names you've listed off there both from a New South Wales and a Queensland point of view there's test cricketers everywhere there uh, it must have been amazing to you know not even you know just make your debut but to share the field with such brilliant players yeah yeah we had I remember we had Peter Neville um, who was really close to the test team Moses was captain and then yeah Curtis Patterson Ed Cowan um, yeah it was star so team and um yeah it was just it was it was it was a pinch yourself moment um and yeah on the other side of the field they had guys like Nestor, Feldman um all these guys that I remember playing Jason Flores um almost remember everyone on the ground just it was it was one of the most surreal experiences um and it was a full house in North Sydney as well it's obviously a beautiful ground to watch you're quite close to the action because it's quite small um but yeah one of the great days and then um yeah I think we celebrated that night um, and then, you know, in the morning or the day after, I remember we had to fly almost back to Brisbane to play a shield game. So we didn't get to celebrate for long, but that was when the tournament format was, it was all played at once in October to kick off the season. And then you started the shield. So um, there was some juice celebrations, but it was, yeah, it was still an amazing memory to have, which is great. Yeah, it certainly would have been, I would think. But um, in that final, you obviously won the game. You took one wicket in the, in Queensland City. Do you remember whose wicket you took? I got Luke Feldman out. I think it was the last wicket. Yeah, caught on bowls. Good memory. <laughs> yeah. Good memory. Brilliant. Yeah. So then moving on from those kind of formats to Big Bash kind of side of things. Now, last year, we'll go straight into last year's tournament, BBL 11. It was quite a hectic one with COVID and things happening here and there. Teams, kind of the stars had so many like local players who were called up to play for them. Well, it didn't affect the strikers too much, I guess, from a viewer perspective. Uh, but from kind of the inside within the team, would you say the same? And how was that season for you? Yeah, it, it's it's such a it's such a tough one because um, you know I, was, I found it quite funny when people were you know coming out and complaining and stuff like that. Like at the end of the day, you know, and I've spoken to Pat about this. It's like you we did the best we could, and we'd signed a deal with the broadcaster, so. The games had to go on. As long as, um, you know, teams could field a team of some description, we needed the games to go ahead. So as tough as it was and being boxed into hotels and this kind of thing, um, you know, we were on chartered flights. We, I felt very safe in Adelaide. Um, you know, there's only 1.2 million people down here. But also we only had one uh, COVID case in the team and that was Matt Renshaw. Um, so we were able to isolate and stuff very well. felt very safe. Um, so very thankful for that. And as you say, there were teams that were absolutely depleted. Mm. Um, so yes, the product itself was probably um, diminished somewhat, but at the end of the day, you want to some new talent. And whilst people may not appreciate that now, you know, we've had the draft and all this sort of stuff um, in the last six months uh, for the upcoming season. Uh, I feel like it was a really um, cool season for us to, to map out where we are as a team and how united we were in that kind of... Um, that kind of whirlwind. I think the guys were really obedient, um, looked after themselves well, and we ticked all the right boxes. Um, you know, guys had partners, families, kids. Um, so heaps of curveballs and very uh, certainly very difficult. I appreciate that. But like I mean, Cricket Australia um, and the ACA for getting through it, and um, we were all able to get through it um, somewhat uns unscathed. Um, you know, a lot more teams than others, but. Yeah, I think we're obviously at an advantage um, from a striker's point of view playing those teams when they had COVID cases, no doubt. But there, I, I never felt that we, we played a team that were completely depleted or diminished and they had no chance of winning the game. Um, I still think we went on that magical run at the end of the tournament against the best sides. And um, eventually we ran into one of the best sides in the tournament historically and, and they were too good for us at home. But um, yeah, I mean, teams weren't at full strength, but, um, you know... I. I certainly don't discount the fact that we were, you know, you know, ad advantaged out of it, but also we were doing the right thing. So I'm, I'm certainly not going to um, play down any of the performances of our local players at all. 
Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, what you said at the start there, it was it was really weird because it's never been an experience quite like it, I'm sure, for the players, but also for the people watching. Because I remember standing at home, like, and it was one of the, they put out a post saying, like, we're unsure whether the game's even going to go ahead and it's supposed to start in like an hour or something like that. So we're standing at home going, like, do we even go in? Like, is the game going ahead? What's happening? Which was really weird. But you mentioned there about unearthing young talent. And for the strikers, especially, that was when Tom Kelly and Henry Hunt really got their opportunities to to show what they could do. And they did really well. So what was it like to kind of bring them into the team? I'm sure they've been in and around the squad for a bit, but to actually get game time, how is that bringing them in and nurturing them into big bash cricket? Well, and, that, and that's another great point. And that's another challenge that the, the teams have is when you unearth these guys and you play them, you know, there's an open market somewhat. So the danger for me was always giving these guys games and then, them, you know, no doubt doing so well. And then, you know, us losing them. But we've thankfully been able to contract Henry and Tom. Um, yeah, I think Tom set the world on fire, obviously, a little bit in, in his debut game at, uh, at Spotless against the Scorchers. Um, and he really surprised me uh, a lot. I'd, I'd seen him hit the ball really well in the nets and in the trial games. But, you know, it's a different thing to come out at that age and, and do it on the, you know, on the big stage. I know there's no crowds and things like that. But, yeah, he, it was just water off a duck's back. It didn't matter who was bowling to him. He, he played really well. He played with a lot of freedom. Um, and I think Henry Hunt is just like a, I just think he's one of the best young players in Australia. So even if it wasn't his suited format, he was always going to find answers and solutions out really quickly because he's just super talented. Um, and yeah, I, I, again, super thankful that they've been able to stay on the list, but um, you know, they're probably coming at the expense of places like your Redshaws and your Wells who are, you know, a bit older and stuff like that. I think having experience in Hunt and Kelly this year going forward, um, I think we're going to have a stacked batting order for the majority of the season, looking at the guys we drafted into Grondheim and Hose. But I think if they were to get injured or guys were to miss out, and if Henry or Tom aren't already in the first 11, that, that would elevate them in and they're not coming in for their first, second or third game. They've played enough already. So we, we expect performances out of them straight away, which is invaluable in this format. Yeah, and I mean, mentioning that as well, we've signed Chris Lynn, but he's also not going to be available for most of the season I don't think because he's obviously going over to play in South African League I think it is so it'll be really interesting to see what happens with Chris Lynn and and who fills those kind of shoes but then still talking about that season the strikers were so close and these couple of games were ups and downs and roller coasters for strikers fans because obviously the the eliminator against the Thunder was incredible it was really down to you to be honest you you were bowling that last over they needed 14 off it and um, you're on a hat trick and then it was dropped by John O'Wells. Was he, do you know if he was aware of the That's situation? Um, yeah. And what, what was that whole over like for you? Well, that, that, yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was, that was an amazing game. That was, um, I remember Alex Ross and Jason Sang were batting beautifully. And I thought, I almost thought while we're out there, I thought we, we had enough runs to defend. We batted beautifully, but then got that feeling out. Uh, in the middle after the timeout at 10 overs when we were bowling, I was like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. It's going to swing on a couple of overs. I think it's going to come down to maybe myself and Siddle. Um, I didn't know what order and stuff because Sid was captaining and he was really good um, at managing all of that. It was bloody tough um, with COVID and stuff around as well. But yeah, I was, I was really nervous, but I was also, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I had a really clear idea of what I wanted to do, um, where I wanted them to hit the ball, um, and then once once we got rid of uh, once I got rid of Alex Ross, I was certainly a lot more confident because I thought, you know, out of anyone, he was probably their best batter on the night, and he was he looked like he was buggered because they were running lots of twos and threes. But um, yeah, luckily Henry Thornton took a great catch, a fine leg. He almost ran into Alex Carey, and then um, from there I just set up the over really well. Got Ben Cutting again, um, and then as you say, yeah, the the hat trick ball, I, I probably a bit now but walking off the field and, and being able to say that you've got an MCG hat trick is pretty special but I, 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 we sort of more poking fun at Jono because yeah I don't know whether he realised or not because he was on the mic as well but he was hugging the rope and to be fair I'd, I'd probably rather him be you know defensive in the way that he didn't want to go for four or six rather than take the catch I just couldn't believe he dropped because I thought it was quite an easy catch so I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you both but um, that's neither here or there and then shortly after he told me that he was he was playing for another team, so I was like, well, maybe it's because you can't catch, mate. So, 
Um, no, he, he's a great man. I'll get along with him really well. I'll really miss him. But, yeah, I, I, I won't miss um, reminding him about what he's what he's let me down uh, at the MCG. But, as you say, we then went and go from that game to SCG and I'm putting in pretty much identical situation, maybe a few less runs to work with. Um, and I almost felt like I went from maybe hero to zero because, um, yeah, I mean, if that that ball that I got hit for six doesn't go for six, you know, I played that over my head time and time again um, and what I could have done differently. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I don't think there's much value in, in continuing to try and recreate the past. It's, uh, it's about learning um, what I would do differently in that scenario again. Um, but yeah, certainly you feel the you feel the adulation when you're in that position and you get it done in the semi final. But then in the preliminary final, you also feel the pain of everyone when it's on your shoulders at the end, although it may not seem um, that way, you know. So you can't get too high when you win, and then you can't get too low when you lose. But at the end of the day, it was it was such a crazy time in the world that it was pretty. I was pretty numb to a lot of what people were feeling and, and what they were saying about me good and you know, not, not too much bad but a lot of good stuff it was just you know I hadn't seen my family and friends for a while it was just you know we we're finally starting to get the crowds back different guys were playing who's got COVID who doesn't so it was it was just like the result of the game just seemed inconsequential to some of the other stuff that people were going through so it was it was it was a weird time in the world yeah, and I mean, look, that game against the Sixers was quite a controversial one. I think the the commentary team were quite unsure. Us sitting at home were obviously gutted because <laughs> being a Strikers fan, it was not brilliant. But that's the thing. It's it's like you mentioned, to be fair, like as Strikers fans, we weren't necessarily thinking about what happened in that Sixers game. It was more so about how good that Thunder game was before. So just kind of, if that if that's any assurance, we definitely think of how amazing that Thunder game was rather than how the Sixers one didn't go to plan. Oh, yeah, nice. it's, it's, um, it, was, it was a good tournament. It's such a shame we didn't quite go over the line, but there's always this season and it's looking pretty strong, I think. If you were to say something that you were most looking forward to about this upcoming Big Bash, what would it be? Uh, I'm pretty keen to meet Colin de Gronholm because he's a Kiwi and I've got Kiwi heritage. So um, I'm keen to meet him. Um, our family watches a lot of New Zealand cricket and they're, they're, they're big fans of his work over the years. Um, so I'm keen to meet a, a guy like him who's been around the world and played this format. Um, I would say I'm, I'm very keen to see what type of crystalline we get. Um, it's obviously a big signing in terms of the profile that he has and his record in the league. But I think I, I we'll get a pretty motivated guy to come out and, and prove a few people wrong um, before he goes to South Africa. I don't think he has any, anything to prove or anyone to prove wrong, but I think we'll have a guy that's got a chip on his shoulder and um, he'll show his class uh, for Adelaide Strikers, which is bloody exciting. They're, they're, they're two of the individuals I'm pretty keen to, um, keen to catch up with. But for, from a team perspective, it's, it's that challenge, isn't it? It's, it's like, you know, when we're in those tight situations again in the prelim or the semifinals, you know, if, if we're lucky enough to get there, um, are we able to you know, put the last dagger or the final piece together um, and finally, you know, get over that hump and make a grand final. That would be the ultimate challenge. But um, I think there's been a lot of continuity in our contracting. Um, we've got two new coaches this year. Um, so there's a, there's a few different moving parts and pieces um, in terms of our internationals as well. We only know we've got Rash for about eight games, I think, which is just over half. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's a really exciting season. I think it's going to be a challenging season knowing that the other teams are now back to full strength and COVID's not really existing anymore. But um, yeah, hopefully last year's not a blip on the radar or an outlier and hopefully it's something that we can build on and, and go one further this year. Yeah, 100%. And I can completely agree. That'd be um, brilliant. As a, like I said, as a Strikers fan. <laughs> After last year, I think we, we definitely want some redemption and want to be holding that trophy since, yeah, the seven bblo seven i think that yeah the win was which is a long time when you think about it so we're ready for another win and i'm sure all you guys are as well so you spoke in the last question about new zealand heritage that you know, your family have got and you know they're big fans of, of new zealand cricket how much of a tie do you feel towards new zealand and, and if given the opportunity to play for them would you i've got a huge side of the place and the people um you know that's connected to my family um but in terms of the cricket you know that that 
that dream's probably come and gone. I, I, I guess it was a bit of a pipe dream. Um, while I was living with Pat, I had a few conversations with some teams and um, with Pat and a few other guys in New South Wales at the time. But um, yeah, mate, I, it was before I was really cemented at New South Wales that I was probably in a bit of limbo and thought that that might be a quicker route to international cricket. But yeah, I look back on that now. I don't, I don't really regret it. I think um, it would have been a great opportunity and a good challenge, but um, pretty thankful for the opportunities and those, those types of things that I've had in Australia. Um, I think, you know, mum and dad were, they were, they were as interested or keen as I was at the time. I, you know, it didn't make a lot of sense in terms of life. Um, mum and dad were going to stay here anyway. So I, I would have had wider family over there, but still wouldn't have had that many people to, um, you know, to know and rely on um, as much as in Australia. If, if that, although that might sound a little bit weird, um, and then, yeah, things sort of kicked off in New South Wales and I never really looked back. But, yeah, no, we watch them from time to time and love watching games in New Zealand because we, we have a real affinity with the place itself um, and the physical landscape and things like that. It's a beautiful country, but, um, yeah, we actually play uh, like a family game for my late grandfather on his Nelson farm. So, yeah, cricket in New Zealand are really special uh, for our family. But, yeah, in terms of professional cricket, it's, it's yeah, it. it it's, it's here, not there. Yeah. And like you say before about living in the past and living in the present, you know, you've got to live in the present and, you know, there's the opportunities that will come about in the future and, and that's the way it's got to run. But if we just return quickly to uh, to, to uh, BBL, we had, did a little bit of research coming into uh, this interview and we had a look at uh, the v, uh, your BBL profile on the Adelaide Strikers website, which says the opening line is, Harry Conway is a tall, effective and entertaining fast bowler. If you had the opportunity to rewrite that, would you? If so, what would you write? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that sounds pretty good to me. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I don't think I would rewrite that. I don't know who on earth is the author of that, but I, I think they're pretty spot on, mate, and I think I'm, I'm pretty content with how that reads. Yeah, so you're telling me you've, uh, you've not done it yourself. You've not slipped a, you've not, <laughs> you've not slipped a tenner to the, uh, to the author and said, Look, listen, I've got it here, mate. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> That's why I laughed. It sounds like I've written it, but it's um no. Nah, there's obviously someone in my corner who's pretty happy with um, my work, so no, nah, I'm happy to keep that the way it is. But no, nah, that's really funny. You know yeah. what? It, it it's it's so strange because I've looked at like all the others, obviously, like in every other team, and it's it's no one else's is like that. Everyone else's is just like <laughs> spin bowler, like or I don't know, destructive batter. So you've got a, I think you've got a pretty good one there. It, you know, <laughs> adverti- pretty good advertising, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That free advertising, I'll take it. I'm not. I'm, as I say, I have no idea where that's come from, but maybe it's my manager. It's pretty funny. That well, whoever has it has given you something to work with and certainly described you well. They've sold you well to the world. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, but speaking of entertainment, one of the best, you know, most entertaining games in the Big Bash is the New Year's Eve game, um, and this year it's extra special for the pair of us because obviously it's going to be the Strikers and the Stars. So uh, that's going to be very interesting to see how, uh, how that one goes. You'll have played in a few of them now, you know, given that you've been a Strikers player for so long. But, but what's the actual feeling like as a player playing in those games? Obviously, they're great to watch as a fan, and I'm assuming, you know, Adelaide people enjoy it even more so. But what's it like to actually play in? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's incredible. It's just the big back, big bash on steroids because there's, it's always the biggest crowd of the year. Um, there's always usually a really cool event afterwards that I, I really enjoy. Obviously, not being from Adelaide initially. Um, so all the partners, players, families, um, you know, we have, we have this sort of like this event after the games um, up on the rooftop to watch the fireworks. So it's always a really special day and night. Um, the weather's usually perfect. Um, it's beautiful and warm down here. So, um, yeah, and they're great games as well. They always tend to be really close games. And I think that's just brought about by the occasion. We've, we've had some really good battles with the Stars over the last couple of years in particular. And I think they've probably underperformed for a while now, as you know, mate, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, hopefully we get to... Lily and I can buy you a beer, mate, when we beat you on New Year's. That would be a great fun. That would be Adelaide Oval. I'll, I'll take you up on that. And if it's the other way around, then we'll have to sort something out. If the Stars, if the stars get away, we'll have to sort something out. Um, <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, and, again, on entertainment, obviously, you've, uh, in past years, you've been mic'd up on, um, on the various TV broadcasts. Is that something that you uh, hope to do again, this season and potentially, you know, after your playing career, is it something you want to, you know, maybe express yourself a bit more on, on TV and like a commentary team or something? Yeah, I always get always get asked about this stuff. It's it's certainly not something that I rehearse or 
or practice going into games. Um, it's completely off the cuff and stuff. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm just a bit more um, colourful than a few of my teammates. So it's obviously received really well. And I know Michael Vaughan and Adam Gilchrist were really happy with it last year. But yeah, I was obviously on the back of a really good game, as Lily said before, at the MCG. It was, uh, you know, the spirits are riding high. But yeah, I mean, in terms of after I, I finish playing, I'm not sure where that'll take me. I, I, I really like... Um, the idea of commentating and um, remaining in the game. I'm not sure what capacity that looks like. I think I'm probably a little bit naive to think that, you know, just because um, I've got a few one-liners and accents and stuff that I'm going to walk into a job. I, I certainly don't see it that way. And I think there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. I think uh, Fox Sports and KO and Channel 7 are, are brilliant in the way that they deliver our game. And to be honest, man, I'm probably not as big of a name as a lot of the guys that do it these days. But, um, yeah, it's something that I'm really interested in. I think it's a pretty cool product to deliver the Big Bash. And um, it's really interactive. And it's grown legs over the years pretty amazingly. But, um, yeah, it's not something that I'm, I'm that set on just yet. Yeah, obviously, you've done a fair few impressions and we've brought life to the Big Bash over the years and me and Lily are both commentators and we both enjoy your work if that's a little bit of solace so uh, hopefully <laughs> if it's something that Fox Cricket can get behind and and Seven can get behind whichever it may be then uh, then we can certainly get behind as well so perhaps it's got legs but you said in that answer there that you were um, perhaps the most colourful of your strikers teammates but if there's another teammate that, that makes you laugh or you know maybe it's your favourite teammate or gives you the most comedy who do you reckon that would be? Oh, I think I think Rashid Khan is just like He's just something else. He, yeah, he's he's as funny as anyone, and he's not even trying to be funny. Like he's a bit of a prankster and a joker, but he's um he's a pretty amazing human being. He um he always makes everyone smile in the changing room. Um, Travis Head's pretty good. Like he's pretty he get he rips into people. Um, Peter Siddle's the same. He likes he likes getting into people. He's very funny. Um, uh, who else likes to laugh? Like Wes Agar loves to laugh. Um. I find Jake Weatherall really funny, but he's, I reckon he's quite shy. He's not, you know, you, you may not ever, you know, he may never bring that colour out onto the field, um, unfortunately, but I reckon those guys are the main ones that you go to for a laugh at training. They're pretty cool. Yeah, and you mentioned Rashid there. And I was wondering, because I don't know if you've, you probably have, but that video where he was doing the roof climb with Phil Salt. <laughs> um, now his Adam Gilchrist impression, <laughs> do you think his compares to your Bumble impression? <laughs> no, nah, I've, I, have, I don't think that's, I have no idea what that impression is, but it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And, and Salty definitely put him up to it. Um, no, nah, they, were, they were a great duo because they were really funny because they, they both played at Sussex together uh, and then they both came out here. So they were like best mates. And it was like a, they are probably like brothers home away from home. So no, nah, that was so funny when they released that. And then he, he did it with Matt Renshaw and did it again. I was, yeah, I was in stitches. He's, He's too good, Rashid. So I hope he keeps coming back. Yeah, absolutely. He, um, I watched the video literally the other day, and it's always so funny because he, he's just <laughs> he, he. I think he like because he genuinely thinks that that's that's what Adam Gilchrist sounds <laughs> yeah. like, and it's so funny. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, moving on now. In two thousand seventeen, you played in the Prime Minister's playing eleven against Sri Lanka. Now that's a it's really specific. <laughs> specific kind of thing I've never heard of it before doing some research today so Malcolm Turnbull was the prime minister at the time do you know anything about the selection process and how the team was selected for that at all yeah good call I, I don't think the prime minister has anything to do with it honestly I think it's chosen by Cricket Australia and then you wheeled out as like a best next 11 for or like a you know upcoming youngsters that they want to have a look at um, or guys that haven't played Big Bash that they want to see play T20. That's the way that I looked at it anyway. Um, and also, like, there's teams at the time that are playing that don't want to release their best players, obviously, and get injured um, or travel around and all that type of stuff. So it's, it's, there's a bit of that all mixed into one. I, I certainly wasn't picked um, for anything special, but it was a really cool experience um, because you meet guys that you play against at state level um, and you're never going to have that opportunity to play with them again. But... I, I remember, I don't think we played that well. I, don't, I definitely didn't bowl well. We lost to Sri Lanka and they played really, really well um, at Manuka. But it was cool because heaps of people came. Um, it was a great experience and stuff. But yeah, there's, there's, nothing, like, there's nothing like Malcolm Turnbull or um, you know, Anthony Albanese. They don't actually, I don't think they actually picked the team. I, I'm not even sure they're massive fans of cricket, to be honest. 
Yeah. Well, because I was going to say that what we had down was like, if if it was the case, if he did pick the team, then we're going to ask, how does it feel to be one of Malcolm Turnbull's favourite cricketers? <laughs> but because, because he doesn't pick the team, and that's maybe not. No, nah, okay. I, I wish it. I wish it was because I'd have a story about that. But yeah, honestly, I, I genuinely don't even think he knows the team sheet. Like he came out for a photo and then went back to his box, and I was like, no worries. Well, maybe you can just pretend that he did pick the team, and he is, <laughs> you are one of his favourite cricketers, one of the eleven that's in there. Yeah, I could. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I could remember that. Yeah. No, but um, no, that's interesting actually. Um, and then obviously it was against Sri Lanka, so it was quite a, an elite Sri Lankan team. Did you get to like have any interaction with them, kind of off the field? And if so, did you kind of pick up anything from them there? No, to be honest, we didn't. I don't. It was pretty COVID, and there wasn't any of that. But no, nah, there, there just wasn't like a heap of our guys that knew any Sri Lankan players or and vice versa. So, you know, I, I think they would have looked at us like a bit of a, you know a bit of a composite team and and there wasn't heaps of interaction between the sides. There was no love loss or anything like that. It was just, um, no, there wasn't a heap of crossover. I remember our, our captain was Adam Voges. So he was probably most likely, Michael Clark was cap, uh, like uh, coaching. So um, yeah, outside of him, like I don't think there would have been a, yeah, there would have been heaps, heaps of people that know, that knew each other on either team because we were quite young. Yeah, so to, to lead on from that, one of the important things that we, you know, we both wanted to ask was, was the Bumble impression? You were probably expecting this, uh, to be honest, but I'm a Lancashire fan. I'm from Lancashire back home. And so Bumble has oh, given, yeah. Me, yeah, given me a lot, of, a lot of joy over the years. And so hearing that impression was just like absolutely golden to me. And, you know, as a Lancastrian, <laughs> it, it, it's really, it's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> because we hear so many people try and do our accent and so many people stop it up. <laughs> and you're, you're probably the best, the best I've seen. So uh, where in the world did that come from? And when did you realise you were actually half decent at, at being a Lancastrian? Well, I reckon, I reckon it would have had a bit to do with, uh, for Dad's work, we lived in the UK for five years. So we, I lived in London from like ages five to 10, which, which sounds young, but um, yeah, loved my time over there. And then we went on like a cricket tour for my school. I found just just hearing all these accents, I was like, this is so weird. And and the fact that like you go to different parts of England and they're different accents, I'm like, that just rock, rocked my mind. And then I, I started watching England cricket. I think England's best place to watch cricket on TV, like better than Oz, better than New Zealand, better than South Africa, better than India. So watching that telecast, and you got Atherton, Bumble, um, Jeffrey Allett, like uh, the um, Nick Knight, Nasser Hussain. Like all of them, they've all got different sounds. And and then I played club cricket in Derby um, right before I played for New South Wales. And they had an unbelievable accent. Um, and they're in the Midlands. So I just learned about all the different regions that there were and um, found it fascinating. But then, you know, whenever he was on the screen, he's making people laugh and it was a great accent. I was just like, I don't know, it's just out of nowhere. I, I think I learned it and developed it. And then I did it in front of a few people and they loved it. So I was just like, oh, I need to. I need to run with this. I remember doing it in front of um, a few of the big names in New South Wales when we were having a few beers and they loved it. So uh, you're right. There's a, there's a lot of guys that think they can do English accents and they're terrible. And the English like imports or the overseas players that come over and play for our teams are like, that's terrible. Um, but yeah, it's good that it's actually appreciated from English people. That probably means more than um, people from Sydney or Adelaide. Yeah, because I live about 15 minutes away from, from where Bumble used to live and where Bumble's from. So it's a pretty similar um, similar accent, obviously, because it's from the same place. But yeah, I was just first time I listened to that. I'm thinking this is absolutely quality. Um, <laughs> I just it's not something you expect somebody like to impersonate Bumble <laughs> to do it so well and to put that much effort into it. Like you can tell it's not like a, a five minute thing. It was similar to when uh, was it Tim Ludeman? Did he do the? Was it Tim Ludeman? Oh yeah, I yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just my mind went straight out to that. And I'm thinking. These strikers players, people who play for strikers, <laughs> they know what they're doing with these impressions. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Do a double act. yeah, I I remember that. I never never crossed over with him, but he did that on live TV, which is pretty impressive. While he was on the field as well, that was funny. Yeah, 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 it was great. Yeah. Do you have, I guess, from any kind of cricket that you've played over the years, any grade? Do you have a favourite cricket memory? If you could narrow it to one. Oh. I mean, I've, I've won the Sheffield Shield and I've won a Marsh Cup. Um, but honestly, I, I look really fondly on 
Um, some of the years that I've played at New South Wales, definitely. But I, I would say the camaraderie and the, um, the relationships I've built when I come out of school and we played the Green Shield year at Northern Districts Cricket, uh, that was a club level. That was, that was certainly one of my favourite years. It was guys from all over different parts of Northern Sydney coming together from different backgrounds and um, played on a Saturday and then a Sunday. And it was, pride, it was quite an intensive league. And it's probably when I was playing my most cricket as a young as a young man that, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that year. It was, it was awesome. Um, and, then, and then it filtered off into like 17, 19s in grade cricket, but they're my fondest memories, I think. Um, and then in New South Wales, it's, it's all the relationships that you develop over the years. It's yeah, obviously we won a couple of tournaments, but you know, lots of those guys that I played with they, that that's a blip on their radar. And um, you know, you certainly wouldn't know that the way that they treat and interact with people at training and, and in games, you know, they've won world cups, ashes, all that type of thing. But, yeah, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be mates for a long time. And I, I was lucky enough to go to a couple of weddings recently. Um, flew in from Adelaide and, yeah, they're amazing weddings. But nice to see, you know, the impact that you've had on a few people that are pretty special people and great cricketers. So, yeah, I was, I was wrapped with that. And, yeah, I'd say it's the relationships I developed in New South Wales. That's, that's probably the biggest thing that I'll take away from the game when I stop playing. Yeah, no, that's brilliant to hear. And then if you had to think into the, the either the near future or the far future, what would be your goals? Yeah, nice. No, so I, I think about this pretty regularly down here. I obviously don't have a heap of family and stuff. I think what drives me most is, um, you know, trying to play some county cricket. So I'd love to play eight big bash games this year and go over to England and test myself with the Dukes ball. Um, it's obviously an Ashes year. Um, as I say, in 2015, I went and played some club cricket in Derby, but I've always wanted to play county cricket. I think I've suited to the conditions really well. I don't really discriminate in where I want to play, um, but I'd love the opportunity at the end of our season here in Australia to go over there and, um, yeah, play county cricket. It's a huge goal on my agenda. And obviously, returning to the Aussie A setup would be um, right up there as well. I know I've got to take a lot of wickets down here to get myself back in the frame in, in rep cricket, but you know, with that on the horizon, with county cricket and an Ashes year in England, um, you know, that's all pretty exciting. So uh, my brother lives over there now and he works over there. So I'd, I'd also be able to tick that box and, and visit my brother, which is great. So um, I would say in the next six to 12 months, those, those would be the biggest goals in the off season. But um, yeah, it'd be nice to win some silverware um, for South Australia. I think the best way that you get yourself into the rep teams and individually you see success is is being a part of the teams that are winning games. So if I can try and transform South, uh, South Australian cricket a little bit uh, and the way that they're looked at, um, you know, they've obviously recruited pretty well, but it doesn't mean anything if you're not winning games. So first and foremost, yeah, we'd love to get back into a, like a big batch final for the strikers and hopefully maybe, you know, another final for Shield or um, one day cup. It's, it's obviously going to be a bit of a process because our group's so young, but um, yeah, there, there's some individual and group goals that I, I, I would say on a daily basis, I'll probably revisit quite quite often. Yeah, I'm sure Bumble would have you at Old Trafford, mate. So if you wanted to, uh, <laughs> to, go, to go up north and play some county cricket, I'm sure we'd have you at that. 100%. 100%. Um, but just finally, before we round things off, we have a few quick fire questions that we like to uh, run to all our guests. So if you're fine to go with those, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with um, start with these. So um, do you prefer white ball or red ball cricket? I prefer red ball. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a cool question, though. Like, I've played a lot more right, white ball in the last few years. I think red ball is the ultimate test. Um, and I, I'd see myself as a test cricketer if I, if I were to go to the next level. I think I'm a four-day player. I can't see myself breaking into the white ball squads for Australia. So I've always sort of favoured what I'm good at or what I'm better at. My record suggests that I'm a better red ball bowler. Um, love watching the odd T20 here and there. But on TV, I love watching test cricket in England, South Africa. Uh, Australia and New Zealand so yeah that's the pinnacle of our sport in my opinion um, I'll say I'll say Red Bull yeah. Do you prefer playing at the SCG or Adelaide Oval I know you answered this one before pretty much Adelaide Oval mate and I do not apologise to anyone for that I agree yeah. I can I can back you on that one I haven't played <laughs> there I haven't played there but it's my favourite place to, to watch for sure yeah it's unbeatable yeah it's a wonderful ground um, would love to get the opportunity to go many more times and hopefully I do but Right, let's say hypothetically, hopefully this doesn't happen. You're stuck on a desert island and you can take one person and two things. Who and what do you take? I would take LeBron James and I would take I would take my phone and I would take a towel. 
Okay. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Not too bad. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's put it hypothetically you're in the final over of an innings and you've got a chance to win a game for whatever team you're playing for. Would you rather win it with three sixes or a hat trick? And uh, a bit of a, a side note, John O'Wells is not involved in this question. <laughs> <laughs> The hat trick or three sixes. Oh, that is tough, mate. I'd probably, I'd probably wish for three sixes because I just know that that is not ever going to happen. So I'd go to three. Oh, that would be amazing. If I had three sixes, mate, the other team should get kicked out of the comp. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hope that happens on New Year's Eve, maybe, and then. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> If that happens on New Year's Eve, like, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> if I'm over in Adelaide for that game, I'd just, I'd just leave and I'd just go one way to get straight to the airport. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'd, um, I wouldn't classic. even stick around for the fireworks. But um, that's <laughs> um, right, favourite shapes flavour? Oh, um, chicken crimpy. Is that two in a row? I, yeah, I, we've I had might two be in a row on the podcast after not having <laughs> any beforehand. Like yeah. London Bulls. You wait ages for one and two come along at once. Yeah, two interviews in a row. Yeah, yeah, that's unbelievable. Uh, beach or backyard cricket? Oh, oh beach for sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Uh, zero. No, absolutely not. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, no yes. way. Can't I? Can't oh, I? Can't even think about that. No. Nah. Wow. So, what's your what's your go to pizza topping then? I don't mind like vegetarian pizzas, meat pizzas. Um, just anything. I like the crust. I like the crust. Yeah, like the peri peri chicken pizza at crust. I just, I just could never eat a Hawaiian pizza. Even in Hawaii, I would go for the most non. Like, I love the most exotic things on food, but I can't do pineapple on pizza. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's interesting. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Can't, can't go against that. Orange juice or apple juice. Oh, used to be apple juice is orange now. Orange juice. Yeah, yes. complete panel. You've, Love yeah, it. You've, you've come back there with that one. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're back in Lily's good books. Yeah. Uh, favorite cuisine? <laughs> oh, oh, Japanese. Nice. Good call. Um, right. So, say you're on Millionaire, a game show, any game show you want, and you have to phone a friend for the chance to win a million dollars. Who do you phone and why? You know what? Ironically, I think I'm calling Pat Cummins. I think he, I think he reads so many books and he's so well educated in so many different areas. Like he's probably an expert of nothing, but he has got his fingers or his head inside so many different potholes that I would just back him to know all the random things in the world. So I'd, I'd call Pat. Brilliant. And the final one is a bit of a how's that legendary question: Is porridge a cereal? Yes or no? <laughs> Oh, great question. I'm going with yes, because I only eat it in the morning. So I'm going, yeah, it is a cereal. And oh, I love it. Okay. There's, there's yeah. so many, there's so many like bits of logic you can use to say that it, it is or it isn't. Yeah. Different, yeah. different aisle. You've had it, you know, you have it with hot milk rather than cold milk. So <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but, but people can have their opinions. But that about rounds off all the questions we've got time for. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for coming on the podcast. Thank you again and have a grassy day. I'm sure I'll see you at some point in the summer. Maybe Ollie will as well. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, Lily. Faces Conway. It's scooped. Men come round. Advantage for the strikers. Look at Travis Head. He gives it to the crowd. So that was Adelaide Strikers fast bowler and David Lloyd impersonator Harry Conway. One absolute legend he is. Yeah, it was really nice to get like an insight into his career, isn't it? Because obviously he's he's one that you see on the mic and you see him do his impressions, but to to, to just get to know him and get to know you know his his journey and his cricket a little bit more, aside from just how well known he is for his personality, was was really nice. And I think yeah, it was it was really interesting to to find out, like I said, just more about him. But yeah, no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, what a player! Looking forward to seeing what he can do for the Strikers this upcoming summer. Yeah, and just to, just to mention this, uh, just to put this on the record, this has been off the record for a while now, me and Harry Conway have got a slight little wager going relating to the New Year's Eve game. Obviously, the Stars are involved this year. I'll be travelling over to Adelaide to, to watch it. One of probably a few Stars fans, surrounded by 50,000 Strikers fans, is going to be very interesting. But he said that if the Strikers get the victory over the Stars, Harry Conway is shouting me around, and I need to think of something in response to that 
So if the stars win, I've got to then sort something out for his side. So any suggestions, get them on Twitter. Maybe get them in the replies wherever you want. Maybe email us some, message us some, because I need to think of something because it's creeping ever closer now. It's just over a month away as we record this. So just get your replies in the comments. Let me know what I should do in, in, um, in response to Harry Conway's wager and we'll get something sorted. Yeah, it sounds like a plan. So yeah, like we said, you can contact us on social media and you can do that by messaging us on Instagram, Twitter or TikTok at how's that TCP or you can send us an email at how's that the cricket podcast at gmail.com. Like you said, you can also reply through Spotify or you can, if you felt like it, leave us a rating on Spotify. We'd appreciate that as well. But yeah, we hope you enjoyed the episode this week. Like we said, sorry there, there hasn't been any cricket to talk about, but we will be back very soon. Ollie will be back joining us and, and we'll have plenty of cricket to catch up on, I'm sure. But yeah, that is all from me this week. Likewise, enjoy the week of cricket, everyone. How's that? You missed the-